Okay, so front, uh, modern web front end landscape, probably the worst title I could have come up with. Uh, just the goal of this is to kind of talk about where we are today and how we got there and all the things that happened in between uh, the start of the web and, and now. So Kunal had asked me, uh, well, I'm Lee, you know, I like to talk about front end web stuff. Um, what's it like to learn about web development nowadays? Um, Kunal originally asked, you know, hey, I'm a back end developer. Uh, I was thinking about dabbling with some front end technologies. What should I do? What should I look at? And so let's take a look. Uh, I just what's that? I just got yes, he did actually ask that. It's a true story. So, hey, lo and behold, there is a map for how to become a front end developer in 2019. Uh, this is up on GitHub at that link. Um, by this guy on Twitter. So what do you need to know? Obviously HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, all these other tangential orange things are things that he recommends, but then the yellow ones he's saying are required. So after you learn the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, then you need to know about package managers, you need to know about NPM and Yarn, CSS preprocessors, preferably SAS, frameworks, possibly bootstrap, architecture like them. And build tools, task runners, lenders, formatters, module blenders, pick a framework, uh, do maybe React or Vue or Angular, learn scripts, learn uh, a state management library, learn testing, Jest, Enzyme, Cypress, uh, on and on and on. I think you guys get the idea. It keeps going. Type checkers, uh, desktop applications, React Native, mobile, hybrid. There's a ton of crap. So uh, what, what happened? So this guy, Jose Aguanaga, I hope I said that right, wrote a satirical article about somebody that was a web developer in maybe like 2008 and took a break. He comes back uh, today in 2016, well, comes back in 2016, right, in present day and says, hey, I want to build a website. Um, it's going to hit an API and update you know, the page. And he goes into this, well, you got to learn React, you have to learn uh, Node, you have to Webpack, all these technologies. And he's like, that's dumb. I just want to hit an API and update things. So, How did we end up with this mess of frameworks and all this stuff to learn? You know, wasn't web development supposed to be just HTML and CSS and JavaScript? So what, what happened? So to answer that, I'm going to take a trip through memory lane, kind of walk through a brief history of the web. And again, this is not a definitive guide to anything. This is just kind of walking through um, kind of the high points. So we start out with web development. Um, 1989, a guy named Tim Berners-Lee writes a browser. Um, the internet had been being developed before that. Uh, networking computers had been in uh, the works for a long time, but everything kind of comes to a head right in the early 90s. Uh, HTTP and HTML come out, we have a browser, um, the first very popular one is Mosaic, and then very shortly after that we get Netscape and Internet Explorer. Uh, also personal computers um, become more commonplace, so a lot of more people are like lay people are accessing the internet as, uh, as opposed to like computer nerds. So we end up with Web 1.0. So as a note, um, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, those are loaded terms. There is no uh, software version for the internet. It's just kind of a general catch-all for uh, these eras. So when we start, uh, you can see it like 1995, PHP comes out. Right after that, um, JavaScript, Adobe Flash, CSS, all that technology comes out right at the same time. Um, Netscape comes out and competes with Internet Explorer, and then we have uh, the start of the browser wars. So uh, in this era, there's a lot of um, disparity between how one browser implements uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS versus a different browser. So Internet Explorer eventually wins this. Um, they do things like write cool tags like uh, Blink and Marquee, where you've got like the scrolling um, text across the page that flashes different colors, uh, things like that. Um, they have an implementation of JavaScript that they call JScript. 
uh, they end up writing a lot of stuff that developers like, so that kind of pushes more sites towards Internet Explorer. More people use it because it comes with Windows. Uh, they eventually win in 2001 when Netscape, uh, I think it's bought by AOL and kind of just goes under. Um, also during this time, there's the dot-com bubble, so there's tons of investment in web technology. So there's a lot of innovation, things are getting written. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are improving this whole time. Um, also, Flash, uh, we kind of think of Web 1.0 as like a static website where it's just an information or a document. But there was interactivity back then, except it was provided through Flash Player. So you had to install like a separate program that ran concurrently with the browser that displayed your videos and kind of let you have this interactive experience. But um, notably, it was kind of a pain in the butt to develop for. It did use ActionScript, which was kind of analogous to JavaScript, but wasn't uh, JavaScript. So it had also some security problems. Um, it wasn't a perfect technology by any stretch. So we start at... Um, Flash comes out in 96, and then we hit like peak Flash with Flash Player 5 at 2000, where it's now coming with like all the major browsers. Everybody kind of has that access to it. Uh, at the same time, the browser wars end. We have like Internet Explorer comes out on top. And so between, I would say, 2000 and 2005, we kind of have like a stable era of <clears throat> Internet Explorer sites with Flash. Uh, but if you notice, um, in 99, XML HTTP request, or AJAX, gets written by Microsoft for the Outlook um, email application. So this is something that's um, written for JavaScript and allows you to call from the browser to get some data into the page, right? So that doesn't take off right then, but if you see all the way down here at the end of the spectrum, Google Maps comes out in about 2005, and I would say that that's like maybe one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, cross-platform uh, implementation of an AJAX application. So that really helps to popularize that, and that's, I think, when we start to see like the 2.0 stuff. So just to review, what was Web 1.0 like? It was a lot of server-rendered applications, so you had one computer, usually like under the boss's desk, that was hosting your website and it ran all of the code, uh, probably like PHP that's generating the HTML and then sends that completed page to the browser. Um, there's not a whole lot of interactivity outside of using something like Flash. Uh, most of the content is static, so you just go to the page and read it and that's it. Um, there's a lot of browser compatibility focused development, so web developers aren't really free to spend as much time as they could writing like a dynamic application. They're kind of hung up making sure that the page looks good on Internet Explorer 5 and 4 and like all these other browsers that people are still using. Um, there's also a lot of authored content, so it's not user content. Like you don't log on to the page and write a post. Some guy makes a page and you read it, so very passive. And then, of course, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are still in their infancy and they're developing during this time. So we can think about pages like, you know, anything off of GeoCities with, like, the dancing baby and the explosions and GIFs and stuff. Uh, the Space Jam site is still up if you want to take a look at that. Uh, lots of table-driven development, and iframes, and all that crazy stuff. So when do we become 2.0? When, when do we see that? Um, I would argue that these three things combine to like complete that transition. So it starts with Google Maps and Gmail come out. Um, there's these giant cross-platform AJAX applications. Um, jQuery comes out uh, after that and makes AJAX accessible to developers very easily. It kind of handles the, the cross-browser issues and lets you develop um, one application that works everywhere. And then also Flash kind of gets the final nail in the coffin when Apple decides, like, hey, we're not going to support that anymore. And now you kind of have no other choice except to do, like, an AJAX application if you want dynamic content. So here we have a 2.0 timeline. You can see, like, 2004, that's where um, Gmail and Google Maps come out. All of a sudden, from the ashes of Netscape, we get 
Firefox. So the Netscape team, they form uh, Mozilla. They come out with a browser that they want to call Phoenix, but then there's some copyright issues, so they go with Firebird, but then there's still some issues, so they say, well, we'll just call it Firefox. So Firefox comes out, starts um, adding in some features that a lot of people like, like tab browsing and other stuff, starts to create some competition for Internet Explorer. Uh, AWS comes out right at the same time, uh, or actually relaunches, and they have S3 and EC2. Um, so the cloud uh, platforms start to pop up. jQuery comes out, we already talked about that. And then right after that, boom, iPhones come out. Now everybody has a browser in their hand, right? So everybody's looking at the web. And then shortly after Google Chrome, we all know how popular that became. So all, all these things happen right at the same time, kind of like previous slide where all these technologies pop up at the same time and there's a ton of innovation. Um, another key point, uh, 2009 ES5 JavaScript comes out. So at that point, now we've got this perfect storm of like jQuery's out, JavaScript is at like a mature point, um, CSS is getting better all the time. Now users, because they've seen like things like Maps and Gmail, other applications, they want more dynamic content. So now we're writing more and more um, JavaScript intensive applications. They're no longer websites, they're web applications, right? So if anybody is familiar with like classic web development, what happens when you have a ton of JavaScript? You get like this bad spaghetti code and it's hard to manage. So then we start to see frameworks pop up. So first thing we get is AngularJS followed by Backbone and Ember. So some DOM manipulation libraries and then React, Angular, and Vue come out a few years later. And by that point, Chrome has like squashed the competition. Uh, Mozilla and Internet Explorer, like a fraction of the, the users around the globe. Um, and then finally in like 2018, the, you could say the browser wars part two ended because uh, Microsoft gives up on Edge and says, well, we'll just use Chromium, which is what powers Google Chrome. So some notes on 2.0. Um, browser compatibility becomes like so much better than 1.0. Um, you don't have this massive disparity between how something performs on one browser versus another. Ajax uh, really comes out and takes everybody by force. Um, HTML5, CSS3, and ES5 come out on this time. And that group of technologies really enables web developers to create really cool applications. Uh, we start seeing client rendered content instead of server rendered content. So now instead of you click on a web page and you see a blank screen and you just kind of wait for the server to send you the page, now you get data back, the browser is re-rendering the page running JavaScript, you see like a spinner or a loader or something, you're still able to interact with the page uh, while you're waiting for the new data to come in. As far as content, we see things like Instagram, Facebook, um, a zillion Pinterest, a zillion other sites, where the users are now uploading the content, generating um, the things that everybody's um, using. Uh, and then these big companies have um, control of all the cloud platforms, which are distributing the servers, and they make their money off of, as we all know, ad revenue and uh, that sort of thing. And then obviously smartphones make the web ubiquitous and accessible to pretty much the whole globe. Um, and then if you want to think of a 2.0 website, Twitter, Facebook, your online banking app. So I think that kind of explains how we ended up with these frameworks, right? Now all of a sudden we're dealing with web applications. So let's talk about what an SPA actually is and what it does. So this is a quote from Paul Sherman says, single page application is a website that re-renders its content in response to navigation actions without making a request to the server to fetch new HTML. So we've got a website that's uh, re-rendering, redrawing, repainting, whatever you want to call it, without actually getting the entire document from the server. So it's doing its own re-rendering. So we already talked about client-side rendering, but the work of re-rendering the page is still being done. We're still templating stuff. It's just instead of the server doing it, now the browser is doing it. So maybe that doesn't make sense in this example because it's two people or two things, but if you can think one server serving a page to thousands of users 
if the server has to re-render every time you ask for something, that's a lot of work for one server to do versus a thousand browsers doing re-rendering and the server only has to send back data. So it's a lot less intensive for servers at this point. Um, and then a quick note, as far as navigation, um, these SPAs intercept changes in the URL, um, specifically in the path name, so slash home or slash about, and then takes that as a like notice to re-render the page. So there's some little tricks that the SPA is doing to kind of make it behave like what you would think a typical website would behave, uh, but it's actually not calling to the server to get this new data. So how does it do it? The secret sauce of a spa is a whole pile of JavaScript, right? The spaghetti. There's your pun for the day. So what are the strengths of a single page application? You get really fast re-rendering. Uh, you're not waiting on the entire page to come back from the server. User experience is awesome because they can click around and navigate and they don't have to wait on anything. They're just waiting on like JSON data to come back and then the page re-renders and shows that. So specifically, no more blank white pages while you're waiting. Also, the code is now becoming reusable um, because we have like this massive application. Now we're like, well, I don't want to write just spaghetti code. Um, I'm doing a lot of the same stuff. I want to be able to reuse uh, components throughout the application. So all good things. Bad things, slow initial load. So instead of now just getting HTML, CSS, and a little bit of JavaScript, you're getting HTML, CSS, and a ton of JavaScript. Uh, all at once, but um, thankfully it's only when you first load the page. I think uh, Brian and I have opened up like Lighthouse and watched some other competitors' uh, websites. It's just you're loading for like 10 seconds, pulling in tons of stuff. That's the most common thing. Right. The navigation is right instead of right? Yes. So. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in uh, another slide. Another bad thing is it hampers uh, search engine optimization. So now Google can't crawl your page because it doesn't exist. It's just out there on the server. It's just a HTML page that has nothing on it, right? And there's no other pages that it can look at. It, all it has is a pile of JavaScript to look at. And then also, I, I would call a weakness um, this whole build step pre-processing thing that we have to do. We have to take all this disparate uh, code and smash it up for the browser. So we've got way more complex applications, but as far as the browser is concerned, it only cares about JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, right? It doesn't know SAS, it doesn't know uh, stylus or TypeScript. It, it can't, it doesn't care about any of that stuff. So how do we deal with that? Well, we take all of our code and we smash it through Webpack and Babel and out the other side comes some kind of like non-human readable stuff, but the browser likes it and so we can get away with it. Uh, before Babel and Webpack we had um, Gulp and Grunt and Polyfills and Shims and probably some other stuff I've never even heard of. Broccoli. <laughs> the food analogy just keeps getting better and better. So uh, this is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, so it's good because we can use tons and tons of new technology, right? Framework comes out tomorrow, we can use it because Babel's gonna turn it into ES5 and the browser's like, doesn't care. So that's great. Uh, it's bad because now we can have eight million files in our project and then Webpack will smash it all together and let the browser use it. So uh, the, the complexity of websites now is, is kind of outrageous. So here's these ingredients for you, going along with the food analogy. We've got a demand for complex applications, a drive to reuse code because of that and improve the development experience, right? And then the ability to transpile code to maintain the compatibility with the browser. And because of that, the framework storm is complete. So now we've got 8 billion things that we can play with on any given day as web developers. So what, what are we gonna do with all this? How are we gonna weather this framework storm? So as of today, like right now, there's three big players, Angular, React, and Vue. Uh, I don't really want to get into which one is better or anything like that. 
Um, I'll just say like Angular is pretty good for enterprise. Uh, it's backed by Google. Facebook has React. It's uh, very small and unopinionated. And then Vue kind of came out of left field, uh, backed by an individual, uh, but it's fast gaining popularity. And um, I know in like China and the other side of the world, it's super popular, possibly because the creator has like Chinese documentation up. So, plus I think everybody likes the underdog. So how do we pick one of these? Like, wh wh what do we do? It's a pretty daunting thing for uh, somebody that's a junior developer. They don't know which, you know, what do I put my time into? How do I invest my skills, right? So I love this quote by uh, Stefan Mishuk. I think I said his name right. It says, learn on a need to nerd basis, right? Learn your basics well, and once you learn your fundamentals, all the other things are easy. So in this case, I would say like, if you're good at JavaScript, and you know kind of how these SPAs work, Picking one of them is not the issue, it's just whatever the job calls for, really. Um, once you master HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, React, Angular, and Vue are just going to let you do that in a certain way. So it's just uh, all the same fundamentals in a different architecture, I would say. Um, on the flip side, we've been talking a lot and a lot and a lot about JavaScript, but that's not the entire story for web development. There's still HTML and CSS, and that is another uh, extremely valuable and important skill set. So Chris Corrier came out with an article about um, the Great Divide. Um, we've got front-end developers now that are like experts in JavaScript, but they don't really have a ton of experience with HTML, CSS, design, accessibility, and all that other stuff. But then we also had developers that specialized with all those things, but couldn't, you know, write anything in React to save their life. So, you know, you say you want a front-end developer, which skill set are you actually looking for? Do you need a banking website, or do you need, like, a really nice marketing page? That, that's two different skill sets. But I think we're all kind of expected to be versed in both. So with that being said, um, a T-shaped skill set, I think, is, is important. And you could interpret this a lot of different ways. Uh, if anybody hasn't heard of this, um, basically the, the straight line is like you're going like deep in specialization on one subject. And then the top would be like a broad knowledge of other things. So for web development, maybe you would call that like your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then across the top, maybe other technologies, React, Vue, SaaS, whatever. Uh, maybe you could interpret that as, okay, I'm front-end developer specialized, but also I'm a full-stack developer, so I'm learning back-end technologies, DevOps, testing, uh, all that other stuff. Because web applications, I think, require people to have a broad range of skills, and you can't have siloed development teams. So if Michael's working on back-end stuff, if I know absolutely nothing about the back-end and he knows absolutely nothing about the front-end, we're probably going to have a hard time developing an application, right? need to at least know something about what the other person is doing. So now I'm going to speculate a little bit about the future, just briefly. Uh, where are we going to go from here? Um, there's progressive web apps out there. Uh, so we've got web applications that are approaching native uh, mobile functionality. Uh, they're able to touch some of the mobile APIs, like um, I think location, maybe webcam. Uh, also, PWAs are now able to be published to the Google Play Store, so that, I think that's a big step. We've also got like this micro-framework phenomenon happening where people don't want to use maybe Angular Review for their site. They want to have like a tiny re-rendering library to get them by instead of using something like just native JavaScript DOM manipulation. So um, lit HTML is one that I know of. I think, Dwayne, isn't there another one you know? Hyper HTML. So it was in, your, in the talk for you. Um, also, we've got kind of along the same guidelines, web components. So what if most of the website is static, but you've got one piece that needs to be dynamic? Well, wouldn't it make sense, instead of firing up this massive machine to create an application, we just have a regular website, but then we can plug in a, a small component there. This also is, is kind of opening us up to mix and match different frameworks. Um, 
so we can have different technology and reuse things uh, uh, more on the web. So the web has been approaching for a long time, trying to catch up to backend development where we have like microservices and uh, reusable code. Um, the web is, is trying to, to get there, but uh, like I said, the browser only un understands so much. So we're, we're getting progress, but it's not coming along maybe as fast as some people would like. There's also Web 3.0, I put blockchain in the slides for Brian, um, coming off the back of BitTorrent. So this is a, a model of, you know, we had centralized servers um, and applications in Web 1.0 where it's like one machine. Now we have distributed systems where we've got like one company that owns a ton of machines that all have a piece of the application and can serve it. And then now we're talking about decentralized applications kind of like, um, I would think like BitTorrent or, or blockchain or Bitcoin, where you've got like all the individual users that are kind of helping to process the application. Uh, also, there's like this weird compromise of server rendered uh, single page applications where the server does the rendering but then serves you an SPA like page by page. So, some weird compromises there. And then, of course, like as we uh, get further and further in time. HTML and CSS and J JavaScript just continue to get better and better. Uh, they kind of cherry pick the best of these things and roll them into their own uh, languages. So we've seen this happen with CSS Grid and Flexbox. Um, J JavaScript made promises native, came out with the Fetch API. HTML5 came out with um, custom elements to help us use like web components and um, PWAs. So as we go on, like the native technologies get better and better, which is another reason to really specialize and get good at those technologies. So I think uh, I made it under the time for everybody, but uh, here's some good reading and, and video uh, recommendations for me that helped me make the presentation. I got all my dates and browser wars information from Wikipedia, take that for what you will. Um, how single page applications work, if you want to get really deep on that subject, Paul Sherman has a great article. Uh, there's a good video by Daniel Dasi as a Google engineer about the horrible history of web development, kind of goes through like all these things that Internet Explorer did and all the growing pains. Uh, Stefan Mishuk has some really good thoughts on what you should focus on as a junior developer. He talked about the Great Divide and then got my pictures from these sites. 